We are joined again by our good friend and brother, Dr. Cornell West. Uh, welcome back to the podcast, uh, Dr. West. Well, I'm always blessed to be both with you, Sister Jen, and with Red Nation. Indeed, very, very special place on the internet and in the communication system, Red Nation. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, we have a lot to discuss about your presidential campaign, but also there's a lot been going on in the world. Uh, and I, I kind of wanted to start with Harvard. You know, you were at uh, the Harvard Divinity School. Recently, uh, pres the president, uh, Claudine Gay, resigned after immense pressure from the, you know, the donors at Harvard, but also, um, you know, some people, some nefarious figures uh, in the pro-Zionist sort of Israel lobby. But I wanted to go back to your experience at Harvard. I know um, there was a controversy that had erupted in the early 2000s with the former president, Larry Summers, uh, who basically accused you of not doing scholarship and research while he himself was promoting a sort of agenda that was suggesting that women uh, didn't hold the same sort of intelligent and cognitive capacities as men. But I, would, I, would, I want to hear your thoughts on the recent resigning of Claudine Gay uh, in the midst of this immense backlash against uh, the academy, especially at the Ivy Leagues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one important thing to keep in mind is that um, these are struggles within the professional managerial class. So that Harvard, for example, is a ruling class institution in terms of shaping the elites who go to Wall Street, who go to Silicon Valley, who go to the Pentagon, who go to the State Department and so forth. So it's fascinating to see it as an intra-struggle within the professional man managerial strata of the ruling class. Now, for the most part, indigenous peoples, black folk, brown folk, we didn't gain access to this space until the 1970s as a result of the mass rebellions especially the day that Brother Martin was shot, 12, 200, over 200 rebellions. And so they began to open their doors. And some of us made it in. See, I'm in the class of 1974. I arrived in 70. Martin was shot in 68. It takes a whole year for the cycle to set in. And so when we came in, you know, work with the Black Panther Party, breakfast program, prison program, and they're looking at us like, what is going on? Who are these aliens, right? Good God Almighty. So that it's important to just keep that institutional framework in place. So that by the time you get a black president like Claudine Gay, who was the dean of faculty when I had my second class, I had a first class with Larry Summers. I had been a university professor in 1996 he arrived in 2001. The first thing he did was what? He met with every department other than Afro-American studies. And when Skip gives him a call, Skip Gates called him and said, hey, what's going on? He says, you all have been the public face of Harvard for too long. This is a new era. So that's already a certain attack on black folk. Then he calls me in in October. He arrives in September and attacks me saying, my left wing politics associated with hip hop. That's embarrassment and so forth. You haven't published. I said, I've published six books in the last eight years. What are you talking about? You haven't published a book in your life. And I looked him straight in his eyes. I said, I am as much or more Harvard than you are. I went to undergrad when you were still in junior high school. And you know what? what you, you're dealing with a free black man here now. I, I ain't got no chip on my shoulder. I'll treat you right. And I have a grin and a smile but you disrespect me, I come out swinging like Muhammad Ali. And it was clear we were not gonna live together. And so I decided to leave right away because he, he was gonna attack you know, the whole department of African-American studies and so on. So when I returned uh, under Larry Bacow, they, 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 I, I'm older and I'm, I've got a, I'm at the Divinity School and so forth. And it's a uh, professor of practice. So it doesn't even have tenure. I wouldn't even worry about tenure because I don't even worry about these kind of titles. You know, every context for me is just for struggle, whatever it is, you see. And there you had to struggle over the pro Palestinian situation. You had Palestinian students who didn't have a faculty advisor. I became their faculty advisor. We would have events. We'd have difficulty 
trying to find space and rooms for the events. I said, well, wait a minute. I thought we were in the free speech, free inquiry, and so forth. It was clear there was a bias. There were two professors who came up for tenure who were voted unanimously but for tenure but had very strong critiques of Israel's occupation. Both deny. So, I, so, so I said to myself, well, let me just push for my own self just to see what it would be like to get tenure. I've already got a university professor. That's 19 professors out of 2,000. But I had been away for 20 years. So I come back and they say, there's no way you can get tenure. I said, wait a minute, because my age? No, it couldn't be that, because there's a whole host of professors who were already uh, 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 gaining access to the same position my age. Uh, uh, is it my politics around black people? Is it my politics around the uh, 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 class issues with Bernie? No, it wasn't that. We got other professors to do that. Ah, oh, it's a Palestinian issue. That's what it was. And I raised that issue and the clash took place and I left, I wrote that letter of, rec you know, of resignation. So now, now keep in mind, Claudine Gay, she is the dean of the faculty at that time. And I give her a call. I never get a call back from her because I know she's afraid, she's scared, she's fearful. And that's her boss. Her boss is one I'm clashing with, you see. Uh, uh, now, what has happened is some of the same forces now push her out, even though early on she was on the inside and it held my situation at arm's length. I understood it because, you know, you don't want to, you, you, you go against your boss, you lose your job. We understand that. You understand that. Some of us try to have principle and even lose our jobs, but that's not for everybody, and that's cool. Everybody ain't going to be no Martin Luther King Jr., Fannie Lou, Hamer, Russell Means. <laughs> You know, certain people are going to be extremes and other folk going to be middle and lukewarm and so forth. And so uh, so what has happened is what? Well, we know plagiarism had very little to do with this. They were looking for anything. Lawrence Tribe, who was a celebrated constitutional lawyer, he plagiarized Peter J. Abraham's book, Justices and Presidents. Nothing. Nothing. He plagiarized less than supposedly uh, uh, Sister Claudine Gay. What they were concerned about is there's a vicious attack on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is an attack on peoples of color. There's a vicious attack on any persons who raise their voices critical of Israel, especially at this moment. And you mention the word genocide, you mention the word apartheid, you mention the two words ethnic cleansing, you are in a world of trouble. Now, the irony is, and of course, I want to protect all students. You know, Jewish students are feeling unsafe and so forth. We're going to respect all students, we respect Jewish students, whatever students, whatever color, indigenous students, black students. You got to respect students across the board. But the argument becomes anti Semitism is running a muck at Harvard. Well, the Palestinian students, when I was there 5, 10, 15 years ago, getting marginalized all the time, nobody said a mumbling word at all. Professors like myself get pushed out. Nobody says a mumbling word. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to have anti-Semitism running a muck. Wait a minute. Out of the last five presidents at Harvard, you got four Jewish brothers. Right now, the interim president, Brother Garber, he's a Jewish brother. Percentage of Jews on the faculty. People would have to find out what it is. Probably be somewhere around 20, 25%, 2% of the population. Does that sound like an institution where anti-Semitism is running amok? That doesn't mean we ought not to be concerned about anti-Jewish sensibilities. We're, we're moral human beings. We're concerned. But you see, this is all window dressing. And what is happening is, I'm sorry to go on and on, but what's happening is you got a slice of the big donors who are deeply conservative Jewish brothers, part of a right-wing Zionist project that are, that's putting tremendous pressure on Harvard. Same is true at UPenn, same is true at Columbia, same is true at a whole, a whole host of other universities. And, and in some ways, 
uh, uh, threatening to withhold funds, millions of dollars. If you don't do X, we're not going to give you money. Quid pro quo, transactional to the court. What does that mean? That means that places like Harvard and Penn more and more become morally bankrupt because big money dictates policy at these places. So truth, beauty, goodness, what we're supposed to be focusing on when it comes to educational institutions, pushed aside is what we won't give them the money that we will give you. That's about as, 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 as obscene as you can get. Really, we see the same thing in foreign policy, raw power, genocide in Gaza, wars in Iraq, Afghanistan. We can go on and on. Drones dropped in Somalia. We can go on and on in that regard. And of course, it begins with the 400-year war against precious indigenous brothers and sisters. I mean, indigenous brothers and sisters almost sit back and say, this is ain't new to us at all. This is exactly what the behavior has been. This is what the logic has been. These chickens are coming home to roost. Now the rest of the society can see what we've had to come to terms with all these hundreds of years. Mm. Yeah, you know, you bring you bring up some really important like points, and I don't really talk about my job on this podcast. You know, I'm a pro, I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Minnesota in American Indian Studies, um, but you know, I was there at Harvard for a fellowship in the Charles Warren Center, and. Harvard's one of Harvard's original charters actually sets aside money and resources for the education of native people. It was a treaty that was made or an agreement that was made with the the, the English crown at the time. Um, and the crown had allocated some resources that essentially saved Harvard from, you know, collapsing. And that original charter has literally been buried on Harvard grounds, the place where the, the buildings where the, the native students were supposed to stay uh, is, is acknowledged um, by a private donation from, I believe, um, the a Haudenosaunee a donor who put this up because Harvard didn't want to acknowledge it. There was a movement to actually get Harvard to acknowledge its charter and to have tuition waivers for native students and to acknowledge that this was part of one of the original missions of Harvard. And it's, it's fundamentally denied that, but we don't see the outrage of anti-Indigenous, um, you know, racism and structural kind of uh, erasure of Native people across the faculty and staff. Uh, and in fact, I was speaking with um, some really great friends and colleagues of mine, uh, Nora Erekat and uh, Mark Lamont Hill at, at Rutgers University and an individual a congressman, I can't remember his name, um, he wrote a letter trying to get me banned from Rutgers a campus, me, a Lakota person banned from from Rutgers University. And I thought that was really fascinating because I went online and I looked up Rutgers land grant. They have over, I think it was 200,000 acres of native territory that was, quote unquote, gifted to their university. And a lot of that is actually carved out of our territory and was a result of the extermination of Lakota and Dakota people so that they could have an educational institution. And I said, who's, you know, who should be banning who from campus? <laughs> you know, how, how dare you ban somebody who actually has a historical claim, you know, because we're not even allowed to talk about settler colonialism. That's the word. We're not even begin to have a conversation what land back means and these are questions that we you know we want to ask you in in this uh in this conversation but i'll turn it over to to jen because i know she has some questions for you yeah so thank you again for joining us dr west um it's such an honor to be speaking with you um I know that some Pueblo students had the opportunity to hear you speak when they were touring Harvard, um, Princeton, Princeton, um, some years back. And uh, some of our comrades actually had the pleasure of joining you. So just know that you've been influencing um, our development and our politics for a long time. Um, I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, but last time we spoke, um, 
Nick had mentioned that a recent poll showed that over 44% of Americans would be willing to vote third party or for an independent candidate um, in the next election if it's between um, Trump and Biden. And so um, since we last talked, um, we learned that you're not seeking the endorsement of the Green Party. And uh, I just wanted to ask, um, what is, um, you know, why did you decide to run as an independent candidate? Yes, no, I appreciate you. those kind of remarks about uh, the indigenous brothers and sisters there at Harvard and Princeton, because I know Princeton has a program every summer. And there was a wonderful brother who graduated from Princeton. I forget his name. He's an indigenous brother. He brings the students over. And I was blessed to see them every summer that I was there. And I'd, I'd have a magnificent time learning and listening because they came with some deep, deep insight. So that I appreciate you beginning with that uh, that memory. That's a very golden memory, a set of golden memories for me. But no, I, I discovered that the uh, the Green Party had too many uh, internal dynamics and too many requirements. They wanted me to have four different debates within the Green Party. It's about seven presidential candidates within the Green Party. And you had to go to a number of different states within the Green Party. And given my limited budget, uh, my campaign, I've got to go directly to the people. I, I really do. I like spend time on Skid Row. I want to spend time with the black farmers. I, I'm, I'm going to get to Minnesota, spend time with my precious indigenous brothers. And sisters. I spent time with my uh, Palestinian uh, brothers and sisters just two nights ago. And last night I was in the black community here in LA at Lamar Park. So that I, I, 98% of my time is spending time with the people. The Green Party had me spending too much time with, with its own internal requirements and dynamics and so forth. Now, of course, I gave up 17 states. We're going to have a, a good 15 states by the Ides of March. By March 15th, we already got Alaska the first one. It came forward already, and we just out of the gates January 1. So we're on the move. We really are on the move, but it does mean that we have to uh, uh, to work harder to get in order to get on the ballot. And the Green Party did provide that. But I just needed to be free and I needed to take the time that I want to take and prioritize the people. That's the crucial thing. But you know, it's very interesting to me that I, I engage in these debates with the right wing folk and more and more that they're, 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 they're saying, uh, well, when you talk about genocide in Gaza, th does that mean then that indigenous peoples ought to have rights that we're not giving them when you're asking Israel to give rights to indigenous people? I say, oh, you don't say. I'm glad you see the parallel. I'm glad you see the similarity of a settler colonial project. And they say, well, well, well there, there's no way anybody would ever think of giving indigenous peoples X or treating indigenous people this way. We're here, we're here to stay. There's no, I said, oh, so there's no moral argument at all. It's just an argument of sheer force and power and presence. Is that what we're talking about here? That if that's clear, let's just say it. Let's just say it. You're talking about terrorism coming from above. You always got these designations of terrorist organizations, and oftentimes they're counter-terrorist organizations. And I don't believe that, you know, innocent people ought to be killed and so forth, but I'm believing just war. Combatants ought to go at combatants, right? Because the black cause black organizations have been counter-terrorist organizations. NAACP was founded when there was massive attacks on black people in Springfield, Illinois. I mean, the whole history of the black freedom struggle is a struggle of counter-terror. The whole history of indigenous peoples, once European settlers arrive, is counter-terror. So people more and more now, I'm, I'm noticing this, uh, uh, they're saying, that, well, oh, are you saying indeed that um, uh, there, there's been the, the war crimes and genocide and so forth, that the United States ought to be taken before the ICC and the ICJ? Absolutely. If they're wrong, if they committed crimes, I believe in responsibility. I don't think that's a radical notion. People ought to be accountable and answerable to their actions over the years. It's, well, that's just bizarre. Ah, you see, 2024 is going to be the year of 
exposure, ripping the veil of that which has been hidden and concealed for a long time, and of chickens coming home to roost. In the language of Malcolm X, people are beginning to see through the lies and how these lies have hidden crimes. And one of the things I've been blessed with is a platform where I can raise my voice and make these connections based on a morality and a spirituality and a care and concern for those who have been occupied, dominated, subjugated, lied on, demeaned, and degraded. And that's the kind of freedom that I'm blessed to have as an independent of the Green Party. It has some wonderful people in it. There's no doubt about that. It has some wonderful people in it. But I'm glad to be an independent candidate and be able to go directly to the folk and talk about this. I have a follow-up question uh, to that, and it's just a kind of a ta- like a strategy thing. How do you plan to get on the ballots in, in these states? And what is the strategy? Because I, I listened to a podcast um, episode with uh, a, a, a brother named uh, Omar Suleiman, who you may be familiar with. Um, and he was talking about how a Muslim, Arab people in this country are peeling away from the Democratic Party. And I would say, you know, um, given the, you know, the, the representation and the demographics of, of Native people in this country, they tend to vote, you know, you know we, we tend to be a rural uh, you know, in on reservations and things like that, but and we're surrounded by red, the wrong kind of red, maybe right, right, <laughs> um, voting right. districts, and we kind of be, become these kind of islands of opposition to the status quo or to the neoliberal capitalist order. And you know, one thing that he brought out in his in this talk he was giving to um, Middle East Eye, he said, "America is dead children." And he said this in the context of the constant bombardment of Gaza by American bombs with the alibi of American support, you know, the moral support, the support at the UN, the bloody hands that were raised in vetoing UN Security Council resolutions for a a ceasefire, but also using, cynically using black representation in both instances to do this. And, and, you know, the, the question here is there is like what Jen just said, there is a strong sentiment in this country uh, for an alternative. And I don't believe that we're actually given an alternative in this moment. So how, how do we ameliorate this situation and what does your campaign represent? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, both you and Sister Jen hit nails on the head here, namely that we're at a historical moment now where we're able to say things that many of us have been saying for 45 years, but it now has a resonance, it has a visibility, it has a saliency, and it has a gripping power that it's never had before. It's almost like living in the 60s where things began to melt. We live in an ice age, things freeze, I mean, all of a sudden things start melting and people begin to see things they hadn't seen before. And that's what we're living in right now. Now, it's also a moment where fascists can become more appealing because people feel as if they're losing their footing. That's what happens when things begin to melt. They lose their footing. They can look for a neo-fascist Pied Piper. They can scapegoat the most vulnerable, be it immigrants, indigenous peoples, black folk, women, gay brothers, lesbians, sisters, whoever it is, Arabs and so forth, or it can be what we represent, which is these are things we've been saying for a while. This is how you connect the dots. This is how you make the connections in such a way that we have some organizational capacity because the problem has always been not just we need more courageous visionary voices, we need capacity for organization. That's why solidarity is so important. That's why we're gonna be there on on Saturday in Washington, D.C. Jesse Jackson's having a big emergency on Gaza with the Rainbow Coalition that Thursday, Friday, I'm going to it later on this week. So hit both of those at the same time. Now, how does that translate in terms of ballot? Well, I thank God I got now almost 20,000 volunteers. You know, 20,000 volunteers in each state. And they hit the ground. Certain states, 
it's no problem at all. You know, Tennessee, Louisiana, 500 signatures, $500. We got some low hanging fruit. Almost 20 states are like that. Now, New York is just crazy. You know, they give you uh, uh, 42 days. You got to raise 46 thousand signatures and they'll invalidate one out of two. So you got to get about 92,000 signatures in 42 days. That's one of the ways in which the corrupt duopoly, the corrupt two party system makes it difficult for independents to emerge, makes it difficult for independent parties, or third parties to emerge. I mean, the, the, the hypocrisy of, let's say, Biden talking about, I want to save the soul of America and support genocide and can't treat indigenous peoples right and the architect of mass incarceration at home and supports Iraqi war, the Afghanistan war, and you gonna be the one to save the soul of democracy. You wanna, somehow you want, you act as if you're the last uh, wall before democracy. You can't even have democracy in your own party. You can't even have primaries to have a Socratic conversation that will allow the, the insurgents within your own party to raise their voices. And I can tell you the vicious attacks and assaults that's coming at some of us from the Biden folk. Now, the Trump folk, we know they already off the chart. I mean, they fascists. They're explicit about that. There's no, you know, they, 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 they're very, very uh, upfront and in your face. But the problem is, you see, if you're going to be anti-fascist and all you can come up with is a pro-genocidal Democrat, then America, face who you are. Be honest and candid about who you are. We have a choice between a neo-fascist leading us toward a second civil war or a militarist leading us toward a third world war. That's the choice. Thank God the younger generation. I know you a young brother, brother Nick, but sister Jen looks much, much, much younger than you. And she got that younger generation. They have a higher percentage of being open to independent candidates than your generation or my generation. At least, you know, the polls say that, right? Because they're tired of the lies. They want the real thing. They're tired of the sanitized narratives that 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 don't want to expose them to the real truth and and the scale of suffering that's hidden beneath the lies that are told, and that's very much what this campaign is about. But we're still very much in process. You know, when we had the dialogue with, a number of months ago, and you know, you get the call from Anna Heath to my wife, we're gonna stay in contact now. We're going to stay in close contact, absolutely, because uh, Red Nation is crucial. And your book, brother, whoo, that's a powerful text. I know you're a kind, modest brother, humble brother. You don't want to proselytize, but buy Brother Nick's book, whoever's listening. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Dr. West. Um, I think young folks, um, you know, my age and younger are certainly interested in not only third party candidates or independent candidates, they're um, interested in seeing an overhaul, right? Um, and it's been very inspiring to see this because, you know, I'm very young myself, but I acknowledge that um, it's the people who come after me that hold my future in their hands, right? The youth hold our future. And, um, in that, we've also seen a ton of support for Palestine coming from young folks, you know, be it, um, you know, they're the first generation to see a genocide live streamed from their phones um, every day, at every hour. They're following people in Gaza, um, and this is really impacting them. And it's also really impacting, um, I think, the way um, – you were talking about soul craft on the last episode, and that was really profound to hear. Um, people are taking interest and, in, you know, they're like, well, maybe I should learn about Islam and what it is because they're so inspired by, um, you know, the perseverance and resistance of Palestinian people. And in that conversation about soul craft, right, you know, Nick made it clear that that resonates deeply with native people here as well. And my question for you is, do you think that, 
Palestinian resistance, like the kind we're seeing in Gaza right now, do you think that is also a kind of soul craft, right? The profound love we see amidst these moments of chaos and terror, um, they're profoundly affecting people everywhere. And, uh, you know, I, I saw somebody say recently, you know, we're not freeing Palestine. Palestine is freeing us. Palestine is freeing our minds and our hearts and our spirits and showing us this profound resistance. So, yeah, my question is, do you think that Palestinian resistance is an example of soul craft? Mm, ooh, that's a powerful and profound and beautiful question, though, because I think that the uh, resilience and the resistance of all oppressed people is a beautiful thing. It's morally majestic. At certain historical moments, certain oppressed people's cause becomes more visible than others. So when I was coming along in the 1960s, it was black people in the United States. It was workers in France. It was workers in Mexico. And by the 80s and 90s, it was South Africa. Now, we know there was magnificent struggles going on all around the world. Indigenous people struggles going on for 400 years. Indigenous people struggles have, have not had the same kind of visibility that the black struggle has. It has exactly the same moral status. It has exactly the same, the same uh, spiritual status, but the visibility was such. See? So, that, But what does that mean? That means that we have to use whichever oppressed group's cause is visible to make the connection to oppress people's struggles and traditions of resistance that are not receiving as much attention. So at this particular moment, it is the Palestinian struggle that is heard in every corner of the globe right now. Every nook and cranny in cultures around the world, partly because of corporate media, but also because, as you rightly note, you know, the genocides of the Armenians or the Tutsis or Jews in Germany or uh, uh, indigenous peoples in, in the Americas, they were not on cell phones. This genocide is actually seeable, visible, as you say. Now, that has an impact on people's minds. I mean, I, I was at a group last night of black folk. My sister got up. She said, Brother West, I, I've been very critical of you because look like you talking about Palestinians all the time. You're not talking about black people. And we want somebody like yourself to talk about us. Every time you get out there, we want you to talk about us. But you talking about Palestinians. And then we see you talking about indigenous people. And you talking about workers. Movement. What about us? Black people, black people, black people. She said, now I see because I didn't realize what was going on in the Middle East. I hadn't taken any notice of the Palestinian situation. I see it now. I, I, I ought to be ashamed of myself. How could I not be concerned as a black person? Well, that's a moment of expanding consciousness. Everybody begins with their mamas and daddies and grandmamas and granddaddies and aunts and uncles and so forth. But we use that as the launching pad to become internationalists, to embrace oppressed people around the world, but we're rooted. She remained rooted, but she was very critical. She thought I was too internationalist. I said, no, the global and the local go together. They are tied together. And solidarity is crucial in that regard. But there's no doubt now that uh, uh, the Palestinian struggle has, as I said before, you know, it's, it's really uh, exposed the U.S empire in its barbarity and bestiality. There's no other language that's appropriate in light of what's going on. And then when you make the connections between what's, what, 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 what it is enabling and then connect it to indigenous peoples in the USA and say, oh my God, what does Jefferson mean when he talks about these savages? in the Constitution about supposedly concerned about liberty and freedom. What is the empire of liberty? Anytime you see empire, you know there's imperial domination. So an empire of liberty, is that contradictory? Is that a lie within a lie? What, what's going on? 
let's 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 unpack this. Now, of course, scholars have been at this for a long time, and Brother Nick's work and scholarship and teaching. And I know Sister Jen, I know you write and think about this as well, and probably published as well. <laughs> that the these, these truths have been taking place and put forward, but not as highly visible at a moment when everybody's got to have a view on Palestine. And when you have a view, can you then make that connection so that the solidarity is such that anytime you talk about Palestine, as I try to do, I like to always tell the story of the ways in which settler colonial regimes in Australia, in Canada, in the USA, in Israel, also in Liberia, among my own black people. We went to Liberia with a settler colonial project, imitating America, subjugate indigenous peoples, rename the country, Liberia, Liberty, the capital's Monrovia at the James Monroe slaveholder. Hey, black folk, what's going on? Well, we know settler colonialism cuts across skin pigmentation. It's human choices human choices, and that's why the issues of morality and political solidarity and spirituality become very important. And for me, that's that's a crucial part of soul craft. The shaping of one's soul character tied to integrity, honesty, decency, generosity. All of us are going to fail because we're human beings and the standards are high, but we know what the standards are and we forever aspire to those standards. And that's why we need each other to keep each other accountable as to what the standards are. Because it's a sad moment, really, when the I think of history, my own black freedom struggle. Uh, and you say, well, how many voices of black people are really out there telling the truth about the barbarism of the American empire? You got the two black folk in the UN. Stop the ceasefire. Martin Luther King Jr. turns over in his grave. John Coltrane, Love Supreme, turns over in his grave. Nina Simone turns over. Malcolm X turns over in his grave. Lorraine Hansberry, Du Bois, all of those freedom fighters. Hey, we sacrificed everything for you, and you end up being a fig leaf for the empire, standing in the way of a ceasefire. Don't you know that just 100 years ago, your own that kind of sellout. Just like you got beautiful wave of Jewish young brothers and sisters, what are they doing? Shutting stuff down. Jewish voices for peace. If not now, they're going against their mothers, going against their fathers, going against their grandparents in the name of what? Integrity, honesty, decency, truth, justice. That's a beautiful thing to see. You know, just a, a, a quick follow-up to that. Um, Somebody like Hugo Chavez, uh, he represents kind of the uniting of Afro and indigenous people. His, he, he descends from both of those traditions, but he was also uh, closely, I mean, he's, people say he's a socialist, but he also said that Jesus Christ was a revolutionary. Uh, he subscribed to uh, liberation theology, you know, of something that looked beyond, you know, knew that there was something beyond just the material world that was inspiring people to resist. And it's fascinating because the Ansarala movement in Yemen, you know, the U.S. media calls them uh, Houthis. They actually drew inspiration for their movement uh, from uh, Hugo Chavez, saying that we need a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a theological, not just a theological, but a spiritual kind of resistance. It's not just physical, military, you know, political, economic, but it's also spiritual resistance. And so I think... Um, you know, Houthis, that, that, or not the Houthis, the so-called Houthis, the Ansarallah movement is an indigenous movement that comes from Yemen, is from, you know, Arabic culture. 
Uh, and it's also a combination of people who are not just Muslims as well. Um, but we see this sort of same uh, uh, kind of spiritual ferocity and intensity, um, you know, with indigenous movements here. And you see, you know, just read read the obituary of Sitting Bull in the New York Times. He was called a fanatic. He was called somebody who subscribed to the ghost dance religion as somebody who was worshiping death, a death cult, you know, essentially. And we see the same language describing and dehumanizing and criminalizing Palestinian resistance, whether they're Christians, whether they're Muslims. It's the same idea that this is a kind of, you know, uh, resistance movement that that uh, worships death. And I, I want to get your kind of opinion on that and why it's important to deconstruct um, these these sort of Western narratives, not only of of spirituality as central to because I, I want I want to ask, it's like, well, then who is your God that allows you to bomb and kill children? You know, that's my question. Um but yeah, I just if you have if you have thoughts on that, Absolutely. and the invoking of uh, Amalek, First Samuel the fifteenth chapter the third verse, Amalek the group that tries to ambush the Israelites on their way to the promised land, and they are told to do what? Kill every child, every man, every woman, every oxen, every sheep. Well, you see, that itself has a history that Christian imperialists. Judaic imperialists have used to subjugate indigenous peoples. Because once the white supremacy kicks in, they don't want to talk about Amos, justice, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. They don't want to talk about Esther standing up against the king. They don't want to talk about Isaiah. No, no. They're going to find those elements, and there, those elements are there in these religious traditions. Every religious tradition can be used to dehumanize people. The question is, who has the courage to accent the prophetic elements and the prophetic potential of religious traditions? And uh, um, I was blessed to meet Brother Hugo. You know, we had long, long conversations. He gave me the, his book, that big book on, uh, when his book was a book on uh, Bolivar. Uh, in his Bolivarian revolution. He was kind enough, actually, to use the Spanish translation of my book, Democracy Matters, as part of his literacy pro program. And so I went all around the country, myself, Harry Belafonte, and Danny Glover, and so forth, uh, uh, reflecting on the folk as they wrestled both with the text and as they uh, were talking about ways that he was trying to empower poor people. And and he had a two he had three books on his desk because I talked with him for about six hours. He had the Bible and talked about his parents and the Bible and how he was still a Christian. And he, I'm so glad, Brother West, you still talk about your Christianity. So many of my leftist comrades are critical of religion. It's opiate of the people. Spirituality is always an escape. You have to be tough and secular and scientific. He said, "Hey, time I hear you talk about Christianity, I always applaud." Then he had Robin and Cruz. He had the Robinson Crusoe, Daniel Defoe, where you think and work with your hands so that knowing and doing go hand in hand, the kind of theory praxis unity that many of our Marxist comrades talk about, you see. Uh, and then he's deeply into the culture and the music as well. Uh, so that it, 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 it was fascinating. And I think uh, as, as freedom fighters, we have to always, always accent spirituality, morality, the resilience of the soul. Yes, we want a rigorous analysis of capitalism, of imperialism, of patriarchy, and all the structures of domination. Absolutely. And, and the Bible's not going to give you that. You, know, you can't turn to the Bible and get a critique of Amazon. No, <laughs> it's not there. No, but they can give you some values and lens through which you view the world so that you then have a critique of monopolies under predatory capitalist conditions that are obsessed with profit, 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 money, money, making, money, 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 making. You see. Uh, uh, and of course, you know, for black folk and for indigenous peoples, it's almost like welcome home. You know, we never gave up on spirituality. <laughs> we, we were never duped by secular scientific views of the world being the end all and be all. 
No, no, no. Look at the cultures and traditions of indigenous peoples and their relations to each other, truth, nature, environment, and so forth and so on. And everyone has to be criticized. I'm not saying indigenous peoples have some built-in monopoly on truth. No, no, no. Everybody needs to be scrutinized and so forth. But there's dominant tendencies in various civilizations. And, 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 and we see, you know, we're headed toward the whole planet going under. We're headed toward moment, uh, attempts of ordinary people to, to, to govern themselves, radical democracy. All of those are at stake. All of them are about to collapse in light of the organized greed and institutionalized hatred of these settler colonial projects. So I guess the last question um, is just, you know, we, I know you have to get off the call here soon, but we just wanted to hear your last, you know, your final thoughts on, there's this notion of land back. I'm sure you've heard the, the slogan. Uh, we've been targeted, we've been criticized. Fox News, you know, has our, our faces and our, you know, our friends and our comrades and our relatives saying, you know, this is a radical ideology that's trying to destroy the United States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to do, Native people want to do, you know, what our ancestors did to them. Exterminate them, remove them from the land, take away their rights, destroy their economies, subject them to a dominant ideology, that kind of mentality. And I think it's a, it's a cynicism, it's a projection. It's, a, it's an acknowledgement on one hand that, there, that genocide was committed, that settler colonialism is a thing, uh, that it was practiced against indigenous people, but even the articulation of freedom uh, that, you know, not only do we need land back um, for livelihood, because if we look at landowners and ownership within this, uh, this uh, system, this capitalist system, there's an owning class and there's a non-owning class, there's a renter class. But yet there's the psychological wages of whiteness, as Du Bois put it, that keeps some people invested within a, a white supremacist framework against their own, not only our liberation, but their own liberation, that they're not even, they're, they're getting psychological wages from this, but they can't imagine a future or a, a present where property relations do not govern social relations or that social relations are premised on equality or that not all land, not all nature, not all beings, not all living things on this planet and in this cosmos deserve to be commodified for a profit that some things have a value like secret sites, like Chisapa, like the Black Hills. They, ha they have an intrinsic value of who we are as people. You don't build a pipeline in the Grand Canyon. You don't build, you know, a pipeline in these natural wonders. But yet nature is turned into a commodity, not for just not just for, you know, so, uh, you know, the, the benefit of all social beings or, you know, so, uh, for like the social wealth, but for private plunder. And so when we talk about land back, we think of land back, meaning the people who work the land historically, who have unpaid wages for the land and the labor and the exploitation that they experience, because they also have a relationship to that land. That includes enslaved, you know, uh, black people and, the, and their descendants. That includes the white worker at Walmart who doesn't have any relationship to somebody like Donald Trump, but may but is told that white supremacy unites them as a people, right? And so when we talk about land back, we're also talking about a larger project of decolonization that begins, you know, with your mind, with your spirit, your heart, but also on the land itself. And our relationship with the land is fundamentally governed by our relationship with each other as human beings, uh, as well as our relationships to the non-human world, you know, animals, plants, the waters, that also deserve that kind of respect. And I just want to hear some of your final thoughts, uh, a meditation, if you will, on, you know, what land back would mean for your campaign. Yeah, so number one of the reasons why land back is very important for my campaign, because coming out of legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., I believe in wholesale abolition of poverty. And for me, the empowerment of people gaining access to land, resources, 
gaining access to that which has been taken away is part of an anti-poverty program. Anti-poverty is predicated on what? The precious dignity of everyday people. Everyday people have been crushed. Now, this is true for workers across the board, but workers have various slices. Indigenous peoples as workers have a history of settler colonialism, have a history of vicious and violent genocidal attack and so forth. White workers have exploitation, but they don't have Jim Crow or slavery as a backdrop. But we're talking about the democratization and democratization is about what? The empowerment of ordinary people so they choose to shape their destinies and live lives of de- of, of dignity. At the moment, the major impediment for that are organized greed at the top, tied to private property, obsessed with private profit making, so that the needs of ordinary people is is an afterthought. The primary priority is profit. And that for me, as a Christian, that's that's spiritual idolatry. I mean, that's idolatry at the highest level to worship false gods and not to be able to muster the the capacity to see other human beings as human beings and to support them in that regard. Uh, and so so that I I, I, I I think the larger framework, you know, I, part of our platform, of course, I won't win all the platforms trying to deal with fossil fuel companies and their greed and nationalize what it means to democratize and nationalize uh, these various industries that are running amok, whose greed is running amok, trying to shut down Willow Projects and Cancer Alleys and Cop Cities. I mean, we, we can go into all of the, the details of our platform. But what sits at the very center, and you and Sister Jen have been so wonderful as you always are, it, what sits at the very center is this conception of what it means to be human what it means to have a certain kind of quality soul craft and how that's always embedded in family, community, one's tradition. Well, Dr. West, uh, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, it was wonderful to have you. Do you uh, where, where can uh, people find your work? How can they uh, plug into your campaign? Yes, yeah, it's Cornell West 20. 24.com, Cornell West 2024.com. And you'll see you got platforms, donation, volunteers, variety of different things. And I am going to make my way to Minnesota, brother. I haven't forgotten about it. I know we talked about that. I'm going to make my way. Absolutely. And Sister Jen, God bless you. It's a blessing to be in conversation with you, though.